We welcome everyone here tonight. I'm glad you all came. Tonight we're going to be talking about water baptism. Many of us have heard about water baptism since we were young. And so we all have kind of a basic idea of water baptism, what it's about. And I'm hoping to get into it a little bit tonight and put a little bit of background on why water baptism, what it symbolizes, why we should be baptized with water, as well as with the Holy Spirit. So, let me tar- start this this evening by saying that the forerunner of Jesus Christ was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was kind of an odd fellow. He was he was about six years six months older than Jesus, uh, the son of Elizabeth, and uh, he grew up, or he was, at the start of his ministry, he was out in the desert with some folks they called the Essenes, which the Essenes were like a sect of Jews that were very holy people. And it's thought that he lived out among them. And he was kind of an, a strange fellow. His cloaks, his cloak was camel hair, and he was known to wear a leather belt and eat locusts and wild honey. So if you had a cactus nearby and a bunch of bees in the, in the cleft of a rock, that's where you'd find he'd be eating lunch. When John came on the scene, the Bible talks about it in John chapter 1, verse 19 to 34. The Bible speaks it this way. It says, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent the Pharisees and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and he did not, de- did not deny, but he confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, well, who then are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. They said, are you that prophet? He said, I am not. Then they said to him, who are you so that we can give an answer to those who sent us to you? What do you say about yourself? And here's what he said about himself. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And this is a, this is a prophecy of Isaiah that said that Jesus, the Messiah, would have a forerunner who would be a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. So he identified by saying, I'm the one who was to come that would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were checking him out to see who he was, what he was all about. Verse 25, and they asked him saying, why then do you baptize? If you're not the Christ, if you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, nor you're not that prophet. And John answered and said to them, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, but he is preferred before me. So John says this one that I'm talking about is going to come after me. But he's actually more important. He's preferred before me. And he makes this statement, because he was before me. Jesus was from the beginning, if you remember right. And he said, the sandal, the strap of his sandal, I'm not worthy to loose. He said, I am not even worthy. I'm not even high up enough up the food chain to be the one to take Jesus' sandals off. That's how he felt about himself. He said, Jesus, the one that is coming is so mighty. I'm not even worthy to loose his sandal. So he was a very humble, very humble prophet. The next day, John saw Jesus coming. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he, he's telling everybody around him, he says, this is he who I said, 
After me, there comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Jesus was before him. It's like when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. It's one of those kind of statements. He was before me. Yeah, he was. He was all the way back at the beginning. Verse 31, John, verse 31. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing him with water. So what this tells us is that God told him, go baptize in the river Jordan. And when Jesus comes, the way you're going to know him is that you're going to see the heavens open and the Holy Spirit come down and descend upon him in the form of a dove and rest on him and remain on him. And when you see that, he's the one that is the Messiah. So, so in this scripture, we see that John at this point did not know who Jesus was. He's just out there baptizing because God told him to go out there and baptize. And when he saw this happen, that would be him. So in obedience, he goes out to the River Jordan and he's baptizing people, baptizing to repentance, baptizing for cleansing, baptizing them, take, telling them to turn from their wicked ways and so forth. But the ultimate, ultimate impact was that he would discover Jesus Christ, and then he would be able to proclaim him. This is him. This is he. And John bore witness, verse 32, saying, I saw the Spirit. He's telling what, what he saw. He said, I saw the Spirit. Remember we talked about that? I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he, the Spirit, remained on him. Now this is why this is important. Verse 33 says, I did not know him. I didn't know who he was. But he who sent me to baptize with water, that would be God. The one who told me, go down to the river and baptize, told me, he said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And he adds, and I have seen and I have testified that this is the Son of God. So he didn't know Jesus to know that he was the one. But when he but but God had spoken. Remember how when when, when John was first conceived and he was still in his mother's womb? Mary goes to meet Elizabeth, and she said, the minute you're, you walked in, the, Mary walked in the house, Elizabeth's baby jumped in her womb. That's little baby John jumps because Jesus is in Mary's womb. They both went pfft, inside their mama's womb. And the Bible says he was, John was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. So now here you have John, years later in his 30s, saying that the one who sent me to baptize, all he told me was, you're going to know him when you see him come, when you see the Holy Spirit come down and rest on him, that's him. So he was baptizing in obedience, and when he saw it, he told everybody, my job is to be the voice. This is him, and he declared it. And he said, I have testified, this is the Son of God. After Jesus died, and he went down into the tomb and the three days of death, and then he was raised up. When he came back and, and met with the disciples who were all in hiding and very concerned with their lives and so forth, one of the last things he did as he went up into heaven in Acts chapter, um, pardon me, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus said, and we call this the Great Commission of the church. The Great Commission just means this is what Jesus told everyone. Here's what you all need to go do. This is the commission for the church. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. 
just a note, but when he says all authority, that means Jesus has all authority. It's been given. Now, it probably wasn't given very graciously. It was taken. He took the keys of death and hell, didn't he? But he basically said, I've got all the authority in heaven and in earth. That's, that's verse 18. Verse 19. Go, therefore, because I've got all the power, all the authority in this earth realm, and you're my disciples. You go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this is a good place where you find the Trinity all in one verse. When you baptize Dale, baptize him in the name of the Father, God, the Dad, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All three of them. Okay? That's the Godhead in one. We call it God the three in one. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So what we say, well, what should, what should we teach people? Whatever Jesus did, you do that. However Jesus talked, you talk that way. However Jesus operated, you operate that way. He was Jesus on this earth. He was the son of God. You're his family. You do the same thing. That's good teaching. That's all you need to do. Whatever he did, you do it. If he wasn't mean, you don't mean mean either. If he controlled his tongue, you control yours too. Whatever. Teaching them to do all things that I have taught you. And, and lo, behold, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, what does baptize mean? Baptize actually in the Greek. Here we go with the Greek. The Bible was written in Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek for the New. Big picture. Okay, that's just what it was translated in. So the word when John was a, the Baptist or when John was baptizing, we think, well, what does that mean? Baptize, we say baptize. It comes from the, the Greek word baptizo, which for you Greek scholars is G907 from the uh, concordance. But basically, it's, it's derived from, it means to immerse or to submerge or to make something totally covered where it's fully wet. So if you, if you baptize something, you dunk it under the water. You submerse it. You immerse it. So if, and if you take some of your flags and you Immerse them down in that dye. They get wet all over, don't they? Okay. If you just kind of... Anyway, we're not going to go there. So, you want to immerse. Because what you're trying to do is you're... It's a ceremonial washing. It's a cleansing. Okay? And we're going to go into what it means in a moment. It's, it's a ceremonial... Ablution. And I thought, what in the heck is ablution? Well, ablution means a cleansing with water. So if we did a ceremonial ablution, in essence, we would have a bowl of water, we'd wash our hands, and that would be like a ceremonial cleansing to make us clean. Okay? So, so and it comes from, the verb is bapto, which means to cover, to dip, and so forth. Baptism, in its truest sense, is a picture. It's an outward sign of what's happening in the Spirit. Okay? Okay? Whenever, whenever we want to identify with Jesus in his death and burial and then resurrection, 
That's what we're doing in baptism, is we're identifying with them. Now, we don't get a shovel out, Billy, and put you in the ground and bury you, and then wait about three days and come dig you back up and say, oh, hey, you're saved, you know. We use water in lieu of digging the hole. But in essence, we take people down into the water, and they're buried with the Lord symbolically in a figure. That's the old man. That's their old life. All the old sin and everything goes down in the water and the washing. And then as Jesus came up out of the grave, out of the ground, we are brought out of the ground with him. So it's a way of pitch picturing us being identified with the Lord and coming back in newness of life. Amen? First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by one Spirit, which would be the Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether we're Jews, Greeks, slaves, or free, we have all been made to drink of that one Spirit. So each of us collectively are put into Christ whenever we, we talk about the body of Christ. Whenever we're baptized, we're actually, the Holy Spirit puts us into the body of Christ and we become washed and cleansed and we become that spiritual body of Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether we were a Jew or whether we're a Greek, which would be a Gentile. Whether we're a slave, or whether we're a free person, it doesn't matter. If you're a human, you get baptized into one body, end of story. And that's the body of Christ. And then it makes the statement, it says, And we have all been made to drink into one spirit. So not only do we partake of Jesus Christ and his body and all that he has, but we're also made to drink of that one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy, so this is what's going on behind the scene when we say I do and we get saved and we get baptized is that God is putting us into his family. We, we're, we're part of the body of Christ. We're, we're the children of God and we all partake of that same Holy Spirit. We're all made to drink of that same Holy Spirit so that there's a collective unity there. At the day of Pentecost, remember when Peter stood up, stood up and said, these men are not drunk as you suppose, because they saw them all speaking with tongues and they were like, man, these people are drunk. He goes, no, these are not, men are not drunk as you suppose, because it's not even that time. He said, this is that that was spoken by Joel the prophet. In the last days, my children, your, your young men will prophesy, your old men will see visions, your young men will see dreams and so forth. And he said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, that's the context. This is Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39. And when the people heard that, because he said, you guys, he said, you guys were the ones that killed him. And they're like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he said, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. This is the people that were hearing the message. And he says, you guys are the one that put Jesus to death. And they're like, we didn't know. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. That means they were convicted. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, then Peter said to them, Repent, which repent just means turn around, go the other way. Y'all are going the wrong way. Turn around. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Now here's one thing you'll see. He says, repent, turn around, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And what will happen? For the remission of your sins. And I looked up the word remission. Well, in the, in the Amplified, which is like the, the broader version, remission of sins means 
Forgiveness of sins. Remember when you go down to the water, it's washed away. Forgiveness of your sins, all that's washed away and released from your sins. So the thing that had you bound, it was clinging to you and you never could get rid of it. You're released from that. When you go down into Christ, it says all things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's part of being washed, that ablution, that, that washing, the ceremonial washing that happens in the spirit. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So as you're washed, as you're cleansed, as you're released from your sins, you're a candidate to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, we think, well, is this just for a select bunch of people? Who could, who could get in on this kind of a deal? Or God's Spirit would come into you. Verse 39, this is Acts 2, verse 39. And for this promise is to you, he's talking to these guys that killed Jesus. He says, this promise was made to you, it was made to your children, and to all who are afar off. We here in America is about as far off from Israel as anybody. We can, we, we're partakers of it too, if we want to step up and, and make ourselves eligible for it. This promise of the Holy Spirit is to us as well. To you and to your children, to all that are far off, even to as many as the Lord our God will call. Has God called you? Are you saved? Did you answer the call? Then you're eligible to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. So we say, what, what actually happened at the cross? For Christ, this is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ suffered once for sin. When he was on the cross, he suffered once for our sin. The righteous for the unrighteous. He was righteous and he suffered for us unrighteous ones. In order to bring us to God, he was put to death in the body. But he was made alive in the spirit. The minute Jesus died in the natural, he was made alive in the spirit. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive in the spirit. Now listen to verse 19. After being made alive. So this is something we don't even see. We see him. We put him in the tomb. We think it's over for three days. Well, Jesus was, was busy during that three-day time frame. He didn't just lay there. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. And we said, now who are these imprisoned spirits that Jesus is going and preaching to? Verse 20, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Remember that hundred years when, when Noah was building the ark and saying, guys, it's going to rain. And they were like, whatever. And they didn't listen. The Bible says that God was waiting patiently. He was about to destroy the world. And Noah was saying, anybody want to get on the boat? And nobody listened. And finally, he got his whole family and their loved ones, the, the wives, in on it. And the eight of them, in it, in the ark, only a few people, that is eight, were saved through water. <clears throat> and this water that saved the people symbolizes baptism that saves you also. So it says, just like those people where God washed the whole world with water and cleansed it. And then these people just get out of the ark and the whole world is clean and all the wickedness is gone and all the, it's all, it's all new. They get out of there and it's wet and it's rainbows and, the, you know, two of this and two of that. And they're starting over and you get a little, a little plant grows over here and we got a whole brand new world. God washed the whole world. And he makes the statement here, First Peter, he says, this water symbolizes, remember the water was a symbol, symbolizes baptism that now saves us. So it's just like that. 
where, you, where God was able to get rid of all the sin of the world by just washing through the deal. And the people that, were, that took him up on that and were in the boat got saved. And the people that didn't, didn't. And he says, this water symbolizes baptism, which now saves you also, not in that remo it removes the dirt from your body like a, like a normal cleansing, but it's the pledge or a promise of a clean conscience towards God. God says, if you'll get down and, and, and receive my son and be baptized and have your sins washed away and, and follow me in, in the obedience of baptism, I'll pledge, I'll promise to wash your sins away. You do this part, I'll take care of the sins. You can't see all of it happening, but don't worry about it. By faith and by grace, all this is happening behind the scenes. They're letting us in on what's going on behind the scenes. So that when we get down in the water, we're like, how does all this work? Don't worry about it. Be obedient. Let God take care of it all. Let him wash the sins away. Let him break the power of Satan off of our lives and just be obedient. Not removing the, demur the dirt from our body, but it's a pledge of a clear conscience towards God. When all that stuff is washed off of us, we get out and we go, yeah, I do feel kind of clean. Well, that's that clean. It's a pledge or the promise of a clean conscience before God. He says, don't worry about it. You get washed. I'll clean your conscience. You'll be like, I don't even remember what I did, but I just feel clean and I feel like I could just start again. That's the, that's the new birth. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're you're mirroring that action as, as the baptism, as the, as Jesus died and was raised. So you're raised who has gone into heaven and is sitting at God's right hand with the angels, the authorities and the powers all submissive to him. So what spiritually happens at baptism? Romans chapter six, verse one says, what shall we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace will increase? He says, by, by no means. If, if all of this is by grace, should we just, just live just anyhow? He says, that's not what I'm trying to say. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? When we're baptized and we're saved, that body of sin, that old man has been destroyed. He's like, we don't need to keep, keep on living in that same sinful state. Verse 3, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? When you're baptized, you're baptized into his death. Remember we talked about that? We, verse 4, were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that or so that just like Christ was raised from the dead through the glory with him in death like his, we start again. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father, we too may live a new life. So as we are identified with him in burial, we also are raised with him in new life. Verse 5, for if we've been united with him in death like his, we certainly also will be united in resurrection like his. They're making the parallel that if, if we go down with Christ, we're going to come up with Christ. Verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him. So that old sinful nature, it was crucified with Jesus Christ. It's down in the water. So that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, might be destroyed. So that we should no longer be slaves to that sin. Think of it that when you go down into the water, that, that old yuckiness, the old sinful nature and all that, it really is separated off of you. That's what they're talking about here. You're dead to that. 
So in your mindset, don't think I'm still, when I get out of the water, I'm still dragging that old thing. No, you're not dragging it if you don't want to. Okay, verse 7, because anyone who has died has been set free from that sin. When you die, it's over. And they're saying, when you're dead to that sin, it's over. Keep that as your mindset. Verse 8, for if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For if we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die anymore. Death no longer has mastery over him. Once Jesus died, they can't come back up to heaven and say, we're going to kill you again. No, it doesn't happen. He's living forever. By the same token, we're hooked up with him. So it's not double jeopardy. Once we're, once we're free, we're free. Now we need to get that into our mindset, though. Because if we, if we keep thinking we're dragging this old corpse, to a certain degree, we can drag it for the rest of our life. Or we can tell it to be gone. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Verse 10, the death that he died, he died once for all. And now the life that he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, and here's the part, here's, here's the catch. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. We need to look at sin and we need to say, you know what? That's, that's part of my past. That's not part of my future. I'm dead to that thing. And I'm going on with the Lord. I'm going on in newness of life. We don't need to keep having that sin consciousness that, that tries to cling to us. Does that make sense? Once we know that we're dead to it and we know that it does not technically have a hold on us, then we need to just get past it and say, I'm not going there anymore. Goodbye. And just live in that, in that thought process, in that mentality. The death that he died, he died once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives for God. Verse 11, in the same way, you need to count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's the key, in Christ Jesus. It's not in your own self. It's not in how good you want to be. It's in Christ. All of this is in Christ. We do stuff symbolically, but God does the heavy lifting. He does the stuff behind the scenes, but we have to keep ourselves in Christ, which means we're always, Lord, I'm in you. I'm in you. I'm in you. If we're just out here by ourselves, we think, well, I don't feel any different. That's where we can get screwed up. We need to say, no, he said, I'm in him. He's already got it taken care of. I'm staying in him. Wherever he's going, I'm going. It's like being under the cloud. If, if, when he leaves, I leave. When he stops, I stop. You're in him. And in him is where you're going to find the peace. In him is where you're going to find that that thing really is taken care of. If you'll consider yourself to be dead to that sin. Therefore, verse 12, because of that, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you will obey its evil desires. Because you don't have to be controlled by that thing, don't let it control you. They're saying, just say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, that doesn't have a hold on me. It's trying to say, oh, you're not changed. Oh, you're the same old, that you all, no, no, I can tell right here. I'm, I died with him, I'm raised with him, and I'm not going to keep living that way. And you just cut that thing off. It's a mindset. And then you stay in him. And you don't let that sinfulness begin to once again reign in your mortal body. Therefore, do not let sin reign, which means to rule, in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And listen to this verse 13. This is, this is a major key. Verse 13, Romans 6, 13. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin 
as an instrument of wickedness. I've heard people say, well, I didn't do anything. I just I was just looking. I didn't I didn't go down there. I didn't actually steal it. I was just thinking about it. This says, do not offer any part of yourself to sin. Stay plumb away from it. Don't even dabble with it. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather, on the other hand, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from life, from death into life. Come to God thankful that he got you out of being dead and now you're living and you can't just wait to serve him. What do you need me to do? I'm just happy to be here. Serve God as those. If you had a if, if you had a death sentence on you, Billy, and you were going to the, the electric chair for for good and someone came and paid your price. Would you owe him? Would you owe him big time for, for saving your life? It's the same way. When God, when God has done so much for us, we need to live in such a way that we say, God, I want to live for you. I want to put all that behind me. I don't even want to go back to that. I don't, want, I don't even want to get, get near it. And I want to live with such a focus on you that I offer Myself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And I want to offer every part of myself to you as an instrument of righteousness. So what I'm seeing here is that after you're saved, you've got the option of offering yourself as a tool to walk in in righteousness or off, or, or letting yourself be used to off, walk in unrighteousness but you're the one that decides which road we're going down and the point is don't offer any part of yourself a lot of these sins these egregious sins they start with a part well I just looked or I just or I just I've been dealing with some, with some a couple of my buddies and I'm hearing a lot of well it wasn't that bad but that's where it starts at you start with that they talk about the camel. Once he gets his nose under the tent before it's over, that whole camel's in the tent. Best time to do it is when his nose comes under there, step on his nose. Don't let him go there. And that's a key. Because a lot of times we just let ourselves get by with little things. We're like, well, it wasn't that bad. You need to pull away from that thing because it's like a snake. It'll bite you. And little by little, it'll get you back going into that stuff that you don't need to be involved in. Okay. Offer yourselves as an instrument of God. Don't offer yourself as an instrument of Satan. It's, it's, it's very clear. It's two different roads, and they have two different destinations. Verse 14. <clears throat> for sin shall no longer be your master. How, how, how's that for a, a verse? For sin shall no longer be your master. Because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. So it's a choice. Once we've been washed, we don't have to go back. We, but it's a matter of day to day, moment by moment, choice. Am I going to live for God? Or am I just going to live however I want to? Second Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22 says, talking about people that return back into the way of sin, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It's saying it'd be better for you never to have heard the gospel than after you hear it to go dragging back into that old junk that you got out of. But it has happened to them according to the proverb. And the proverb goes like this. The dog returns to his own vomit. Have you ever seen a dog vomit? And then after, he's like, I'm hungry now. Don't go there. Don't go there. The dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow, which is a female pig, having been washed, she's a clean pig, 
Oh, look at that beautiful puddle over there. I mean, it's about six inches deep and it's warm and back in the mud. Okay. Now that's a crude analogy, but it's basically saying, dude, you've been cleansed. You're clean. Don't go back into that old slop. There's nothing there for you. You've been redeemed. You've been purchased with Jesus' own blood. Don't let yourself go back into that. So, we say we do not go back into there, by God's grace. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15 says, For in him, talking about Christ, dwells or lives... All the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. That means everything God is, boom. Jesus is whew, that very same thing. Everything God is, Jesus is. In him, in Jesus, is all the fullness of God. How full is God? He makes the galaxies. Can you take all of that and put it into one Jesus? That's how supreme he is. And you, this is you and me, are complete in him. He's all this boom, and you're in him. The heads up would be stay in him. You're complete in him who, who is the head of, or the in charge of authority of all principalities. That means every authority, every power. Principality is something that a prince owns. So, a principality. Jesus is the head of all the principalities and powers. He's the five-star general of the universe. He's the head of all principality and power. In him, in Jesus Christ... You were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. When you're saved, it's like a circumcision in the spirit. You don't see it in the natural. This is uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses, verse 10. You're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were circumcised. With the circumcision made without hands. So it's a Holy Spirit circumcision. How? By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So when we got saved, it was like all that sinful nature was cut off of it, just like a little kid got circumcised. That body of sin, that flesh, has been, it's been cut off of us. By the circumcision of Christ, verse 12, we've been buried with him in baptism. We've talked about that, hadn't we? In which you also were raised with him. So you've been buried with him, and then you came up the other side. You were raised with him. This is all talking past tense. This is stuff that's happened to you in the spirit. You've been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the working of God. God is doing all this behind the scenes. You're just being obedient. Sad and believe in Jesus. I confess Jesus. You're getting baptized. All this stuff is going on behind the scenes in the spirit. And you have no clue. This is how powerful this is. Verse 13. And you. Being dead in your trespasses. This is talking about. As you were before you were saved, being dead in your trespasses, which is your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He, Jesus, made alive together with him. Having forgiven you all your trespasses. Is that a good deal? Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against you, which were contrary to us. Don't do this. Don't do that. And you can't do this. And you can't do that. That's the law. And there's like 600 laws. We, we just know of 10 of them. We think that's hard enough to, 
to uh, control. But there's like five to six hundred if you really want to know. If you read through Leviticus and all that, it'll, it'll drain you. And the point is nobody, and the Bible will tell you this, nobody can pass the law and come in there and go, God, I made it. Man, that was beyond good. Give me two brownie points. No. The Bible says that the law was given like a schoolmaster just to kind of keep us to wrap our knuckles when we did wrong until Jesus could come to fulfill it. And this is saying that Jesus raised, took care of all that sin nature and nailed it to his cross to where it's all a done deal. And we've just got to believe in it and walk in it. He said, Jesus has forgiven us all of our trespasses. He has wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that were against us, which were contrary to us. That'd be like saying, Dale's done this, Dale's done that, and Dale's done this, and Dale's done that. And God just took his big eraser and just went, yeah, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. Dale's like, I'm feeling that. Okay. What about this? Don't even worry about that. I'm telling you, that'll minister to you when you write that. I've got a clean slate. Okay? And that was my use of the board, by the way, Johnny. <laughs> and he has taken it out of the way. And this is talking about the law and the ordinances, all the stuff that we screwed up on. It'd be like the tickets that we have down at the, down at the police station. He just watered them up and said, don't worry about all that there. It's already done. He's taking it, taking all of the things that we screwed up on, taking it out of the way so that it's not against us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So all the stuff that was against us, all the uncircumcision, the, the, the sins and all that, if we're identified with Christ, if we go through the baptism... All this stuff is going on behind the scenes to the end that we get the clean slate. And we can stay in the clean slate just by staying in Christ. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. No. The Bible talks about putting on Christ. Okay, here we go. This is Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all the sons of God. How? How are we the sons of God? Through faith. Does it sound like something we did? You're all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Your faith in Christ Jesus is what's your is, is your meal ticket. Nothing else. You start adding anything to it, you're screwing up. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's as easy as it needs to be. And that's all you need to know. If you've got Christ, you've got the whole thing. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you could see my notes here, you see this little stick man. Well, I'll draw my little guy here just because it's, it's wonderful. For many of you that are in Christ, and we'll just say this is me. This is me before I put on Christ. Okay? So this is before. When I'm in the natural and I'm just living, don't know about the Lord and all that. And then this is after. And this is how we need to, this is how we need to stay now. Because we're in the after. We don't want to go back to the before. All that junk's been cut off of us. We now... I don't wish an artist could do this. It'd be a heck of a lot easier. Okay. 
Okay, so this is me just by myself in all my glory. And this is in Christ. And I'm just going to put Christ all around me. And I just put in my margin, just like a big old, big old bearskin jacket. You know, just like a parker that is so huge that it just swallows me. Okay? And so wherever I go, I've put on Christ. It's just like a big jacket. I just, just like Yoda. You can't see me anymore. All you see is this, and I'm in there. But you're in Christ. And as you're in Christ, then you're insulated from everything else. It could be 30 degrees out. You don't care. You're in Christ. You're in. Does that make sense? You've put on. You've put on Christ. And to me, it's like wearing a jacket. I just I got that analogy in my head. And so I, I put my little stick man in Christ. And so I'm just going to stop right there. Any questions?